John is right that that was uh, uh, a, a portion of scripture, um, and and that is repeated. Uh, and it was also a, a a very select portion that I did select in particular and intended it to end on the question. Uh, and and so um, uh, that was right. That it and uh, for for you know let's remember that. The lectionary selections that we use on Sunday morning are chosen, um, uh, you know, some would say by the lectionary gods, um, by people who are in charge of this, and they are provided and chosen in order to try to give, over a three-year period, the complete story and history of, of Jesus in the, in, uh, in the Christian church. Um, there are many times when preachers look at lectionary selections and shake their heads and wonder why. Why this one? You know, why that? It's a discipline to stick with it in order to not basically be just doing the old familiar stuff all the time, even though, you know, we like that old time religion. And so, but it's, it's a discipline and it causes us to not get stuck in a, uh, in, in a rut. So, for some reason, there are repetitions this time of year, and I'm going to mention that in a, in a minute or two. Um, we'll go with it, you know, ride along and, and see how it goes and, and do the best we can uh, in that process. But um, uh, it, is, it is what it, you know, it, 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 that, that is what's happening right now. There are some repetitions going on. Oh, and the other thing I was going to say was this. And they're just way too long. And so that's one of the reasons that I'm... Uh, you know, I'm doing some selective cutting and trying to, to cut some of them. Let's pray. It's good to be back here loving God. It's good to be with people I love, we love. It's good to be in your word. It's good to be looking forward as a, a new day uh, in the future of the life of your church. Every day is a new day. We look forward to the life of Bloom into the future, and we look forward to being your people bringing to life Bloom in the future. And right now, we gather our hearts and souls. We enter, we rejoice, we come in. Right now, we bring our heart and soul and mind and strength into this place to receive among all the words that are thought and read and sung, to re receive the word that you have for each of us this day. It won't be the same one for every single person. We know that. But there is something that we can gather and take with us when we go from here. And so as we continue in this worship service, we are grateful for your continued anointing so that the words of our mouths and the meditations of, my, of our hearts will be acceptable to you, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. So as I just implied, one of the reasons that we get together like this on a weekly basis is to remind ourselves, as people in a covenant of faith, why we are where we are and who we are. Academics, I've spent time with academics for the last, you know, in the last month. Academics would tell us that we are answering the existential question every time we gather. The existential question basically asks, what is our reason for being? Now, we don't need to know big school words to know that sometimes we ask the same questions about ourselves that philosophers have been asking throughout the ages. Today, the purpose of my commentary is to offer an answer, but any answer I offer is never to be thought of as the one right answer because we are in covenant with one another. And so because we are in covenant with one another, it is our composite of understanding that good answers may be found. As we bring our minds and our hearts and our souls together, it's in that composite of understanding that good answers may be found. So let's see if we can make any sense of this. The questions from the ancient Bible source that we heard today in what's commonly called the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures and the Christian Scriptures, 
They are not new questions. Today, one is asked by a criminal and the other by a community. When we read, such as we are doing now in Bible Bites in this time, when we read the Bible carefully, we learn that King David is actually a Showtime-style anti-hero criminal. He is essential in the minds of some for the lineage of Jesus to prove Jesus was qualified as the truly promised Messiah. When David in today's story asks Uriah, why did you not go home? When he asked that question, it was because David needed Uriah to be home. David is hatching plans to get Uriah killed so that David could take Uriah's beautiful rooftop bathing wife Bathsheba for his own. David was offending at least two commandments in this plot. He was covenanting another person's spouse and he was planning murder. And yet, David is honored in our faith traditions to this day as someone to admire and emulate. Now, this is hard to compute. I can only say that the writers of ancient Hebrew scriptures did not have some of the same Puritan-inspired approaches to politics and storytelling as many of us value now. In many ancient stories, meaning was more important than facts. In the Gospel of John today, the community-based question that came to Jesus will be repeated next week, so you can, we can all look forward to that. Today it is good for us to remember that John's Gospel writer is putting his quill to papyrus 2,000 years ago. 70 years after Jesus walked the earth, and 30 years after Rome destroyed Jerusalem. John's Jesus is a man of metaphor. By the time the author of John was writing his story of Jesus, the growing Christian community knew that all the apostles were dead, and Jesus was not returning as expected. So a new way of thinking was needed. John's Gospel is different than the other three Gospels in our Bibles, um, and that's something that we look at. It is important not to try to blend them all into one long story. John's Gospel is very different. Its stories are more about meaning than history. And that's why for John's readers, Jesus is more metaphor than man. Now there are six metaphor, oh, six, there are six, there are six <laughs> metaphor phrases that Jesus used to describe himself in the Gospel of John. These are called the I am phrases. And today we have one. It's a bit of a mixed metaphor. Even so, here it is. You heard it as, as uh, Phyllis read. I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. No one who believes in me will ever be thirsty. I know that preachers for ages talk about taking the Bible literally as proof of true faith. But I've come to a point in life where I now join colleagues who say we take the Bible seriously, but not literally. So when we have questions like those asked today, the answer I have is the same today as it ever will be. The reason we are here and who we are is to do what we can as people who are loved by God to be vessels for sharing godly love. Regardless. I think it is safe to say that every one of us in this room has some form of loving action we can do safely and compassionately in our own fashion for others and ourselves. We are called to be here and called to go there as vessels of godly love regardless.
In Jesus' metaphorical answer today, he is saying that as bread and as water, you know, did you get the mixed metaphor there? I'm the bread of life, but that bread is going to make, you know, both fill the belly and quench the thirst. He is saying that he presents himself as the satisfier of hunger and the quencher of thirst. As we are the church of our day, we are said to be his body on earth. In that way, we can, as community, offer to people some of the essentials of life. And of course, that means love, regardless. One memorable situation that happened to me while I was away took place in the hotel bar. On the first night I was in Cleveland, and it wasn't that kind, I heard that. <laughs> Anyone who travels east, from Palm Springs knows how a person's schedule gets convoluted flying a 6 a.m. flight from Palm Springs to the Eastern Time Zone, especially when you have a five-hour layover in Dallas. After flying all day and taking the train into Cleveland and walking the six blocks carrying my suitcase, or rolling my suitcase, uh, from uh, uh, this big arena that came up out from under and then the six blocks to the hotel in a neighborhood that didn't have much around it. Holiday Inn Express was the first hotel I stayed in. Uh, getting there for where the Open and Affirming Coalition National Gathering was happening, uh, it was late and I was hungry. So at 9 p.m. Eastern time, I went to the only place still serving food which was the hotel bar. And there was a small crowd of business guys and Cleveland Browns fans, mostly disappointed, um, filling the tables. So being a party of one, I sat up to the bar and you know was waited on there. The open seat next to me is where one of the business guys decided to sit. And as I waited for and then ate my chicken sandwich, um, he struck up a conversation with me. He had been there a little longer than me, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Eventually, the what do you do question came up. And I decided to answer directly and told him I was a pastor. And at that point, the man decided he would tell me what a bad person he was. <laughs> I said I did not think he was a bad person. And then he told me a detail of his life that I'm not going to share, but he told me a detail of his life history that was pretty strong that um, made him wonder if he would go to heaven. And he also told me what he was doing to try to redeem the situation. Now, there's a lot of this kind of theology out there. So it doesn't surprise me when somebody talks like this to me. And I have made it a purpose to try to counteract this kind of theology, and that's the kind of evangelism that I try to do. So instead of the, avoiding his question and going like, oh, philosophers this and Bible that, you know, I just said, yes, I thought he was going to heaven. What I found sadder then his deed was that he started to argue with me. <laughs> he said because he acted badly, God had to punish him. And I told him more than once that it was not really about him, but rather it was about God's love for him, already in action, regardless. I don't know if he ever believed me, but I do know that that's the message. We are called to give. Whenever we have questions about meaning in our lives, and even the meaning of why we gather like we do as a church, I hope that we will always remember that the promise of God through Jesus is that we have in our grasps all the nourishment and grace. We symbolize it today in communion 
but it's with us every day all the time. All the nourishment and grace that we need to be assured of our loving place in creation. And with that blessed assurance, we can do whatever we can do to help others feel loved as well. Thanks be to God.